Hello there, I'm Manish Shekhar and welcome to the Global Dialogue series on Neurodiversity. Neurodiversity embraces how we all think, learn, communicate and experience the world differently from one another. In this podcast, every fortnight, we talk with different people to showcase how we are accepting the diversity of human brain and mind in different parts of the world and the need for inclusion of all individuals with different cognitive abilities into the mainstream society. Our guest today is Christina Ryan, the CEO and the founder of the Disability Leadership Institute. Christina has been an active leader in the Australian disability community for 20 years, working at an international, national and local level to change the diversity agenda, while mentoring and supporting numerous people with disability to their own leadership success. She established the Disability Leadership Institute in 2016 as a professional hub to build and support leaders with disabilities. Christina pioneered the use of mainstream forums by women with disabilities at the United Nations and now mentors and teaches effective use of the UN for rights activists globally while working as a leadership coach for people with disabilities. Hi Christina, thank you so much for joining us on Global Dialogue Series on Neurodiversity. It's great to be here Mani, thanks for having me. Okay. Could you give a small introduction about yourself for the audience? Okay, um, I'm Christina Ryan, I am the CEO of the Disability Leadership Institute. Uh, I'm also a disability rights activist, a human rights specialist, and I've done a lot of work over the last 25 years, uh, mainly with disabled women on violence against women. First, you were the, one of the first people who thought about disability and leadership together. How was it in the early days? I'm not sure if I'm the, one of the first people to think about it, mm -hmm. um, but I think I might have been one of the first people to start talking about it to other people. Um, certainly in the disability community, we've been uh, aware of leadership like everybody else um, for a long time. But um, what seems to be the case is that all of the other leadership people, um, people in the mainstream, so in corporate organisations or in government, um, haven't really thought about disability and leadership as being something that goes together in the same sentence. And so talking to people about that over the last few years has been very interesting. And what I discovered was uh, nobody had thought that it's a thing. It doesn't seem to happen. So they were very surprised. Um, they had to stop and double check and think, oh, disability and leadership. Right. And the thing that really interests me about that is... Um, you know, they, they genuinely, it, it, it's one of two things. They're either exhibiting their prejudice about the fact that disabled people don't do leadership, which of course we do, but that's what they're suggesting, or they just haven't noticed that we're not there. And, and so, you know, it's, it's an absence and it never occurred to them. And most of the people I speak to, that's the response is, oh, I never thought of that. That's <laughs> just strange. I think uh, most of people, we just talk about getting a job. But what happens after getting a job, the promotion, all those things matters, right? A career, a, we, everybody deserves a career growth, right? And that's something that we also talk at Hasha Code. And it's really interesting that you, you brought this up and you're working towards this. Do you think it's easy for individuals to talk about disability at workplace? Does this affect their promotion or anything in any way? I think it's actually really hard. Um, and one of the things we've um, come to understand through the Disability Leadership Institute, the DLI, one, one of the things we've come to understand through the, the DLI community of leaders is that a lot of people don't talk about their disability in the workplace. Um, it's a really risky thing to do. There's a number of reasons for that. Um, there's a much higher rate of bullying and harassment of disabled people at work than there are other people. So it can open you up to a really bad experience. Um, something else that we've also seen uh, or identified is that it can stop your career dead. So people don't get promoted if they are known to be disabled. Um, and that's a thing. And we also know that uh, when people have not been open about their disability, but then they make a decision to be open, um, and that might be for all manner of reasons, they might not be able to hide it anymore. 
or they might have decided to make a stand, a political statement and say, I am disabled and be open about it. What we've seen um, is that that's a very risky thing to do. And when people openly disclose or openly identify as disabled, they can lose their job. Um, or they can be encouraged to find another job. Or they can be sort of sidelined, pushed to one side, and they're never given any internal opportunities. So it's a really risky thing to do. And it seems to be the case that the more senior people are, the more risky it is. So something that I was talking to somebody about the other day is that there seems to be a sort of a level that disabled people get to. So we get in, we get a job, and then we go to here, and then we stop. And so anyone moving beyond that level into senior positions, and particularly executive positions, is, is very much on their own. There's very few disabled people in these spaces. If they are there, they're hiding it, or they're concealing it if they can. They're doing their best for it not to be known by others. Or if a few people do know about it, um, they're very trusted people because those people are the ones who lose their job if they actually talk openly about their disability. It's really awful. I mean, what we'd like to see is more and more senior people being open about their disability because they're certainly there. We'd like to see more and more people being open about it. But until we get more people being open about it, it's still very risky, so people can't. So it's a it's a, a catch, you know, we can't, we have to have one before the other and yet we won't get one without the other. It's, it's a very difficult situation. It is, but has it been changing over the years? Have been more people coming forward from the day when you started and now what has been the trend? Um, my, yes, yes and no. It seems, you know, okay, yeah. Um, it hasn't changed much. We still have so few people that there isn't a real level of change. What we see is some organisations, a few, not very many, some organisations um, have a better culture than others. And in those organisations, it is uh, not easy because it's still very hard, but it is less risky to be open. Um, so we're seeing that, um, but it's still a very, very rare thing to see a senior person be open about their disability and for that to be welcome and for that to be seen as a leadership thing. So it's, it's not very common, unfortunately. What can companies do to make it more, like to get more individuals with disability to grow in their career and to have more leadership roles? What are the things some, they can do for that? Something I, I discovered, I, I did a fellowship a few years ago, uh, back in 2017, and something that I discovered, which was a bit disturbing, was that um, most companies have internal leadership programs, particularly, you know, the really big companies and the big government agencies have internal leadership programs. So they have graduate uh, student intake, um, but then they also have people that they identify for fast promotion and for future leadership. Um, they focus on gender, so they talk about women and uh, not so much other genders, but mainly women. They might talk about people from cultural different backgrounds. Um, they might talk about, in Australia, we have, of course, our Indigenous people. So there might be a few of these programs that actually recognise Indigenous people. None of them, none of them were actually discussing disability as part of their leadership programs. So that's a, a, a big start, is to just recognise that their disabled staff should be part of their leadership program. It's a big first step. You know, it's not a big first step. It's just a mindset shift. All they need to do is, is think about disability in the context of it being a leadership quality, um, of disabled people being part of their diversity. So we still seem to be trapped in thinking that disability is something that happens in those lower uh, 
positions, but it doesn't move into, into the leadership positions. So that's the change. There's a lot of other things that organisations need to do. They need to be um, thinking about what diversity really means to them. You know, we don't just have all these different people working in an organisation um, unless we actually want to use their diversity, unless we want to understand how, how their diversity is contributing. You know, and, and, you know, we come from very different cultures, for example. So that is something we both want to bring into the room and talk about. We're not the same. And that's a good thing. So we want that to be recognised. We don't want um, organisations to think that everybody who works here is exactly the same or they all have to behave the same way because then we're not using the difference that people bring. So true. You know, as you're speaking, I'm just realising that having uh, individuals with disability in leadership role will open new perspective and those perspectives will make it more accommodating for other individuals with disability to join their career, you know. So it opens up more room, right, especially when you're talking about assimilation of individuals with disability, because now if you take a look at it, everybody's in the same trajectory, same career path, but that's not the case, right? Many individuals with disability might not be able to go to college, but still might have the skill set, right? To be able to have those changes happen, you need to start with leadership, correct? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's really interesting, you know, if we think about what disabled people can bring to workforces, there are studies, not very many, but there's a really good study that I like to talk about, which showed that disabled people are 10% more innovative in the workplace than other people. Now imagine that, everybody wants innovation. You know, this is the 21st century. They all want people who are good problem solvers. Well, hello, don't you want disabled people? Because we're the ones who are gonna do better at that. Um, but it's bigger than that. It's more important than that. It's recognizing that, um, Teams that are more diverse actually solve problems faster. They're better at looking at things from different angles, so you don't get that group think. Um, there's a lot of evidence, not including disability, but about other diversity areas. There's a lot of evidence that diversity is better for bottom lines, for the actual profit of the organisation and for the efficiency of the work. So we want diversity and we want people bringing all their different perspectives. The thing about disability that's really good is we think a bit differently. It's not just, it's not just about the different life experiences we've had, but we also have all of those different ways of looking at the world. We have different ways of perception. Um, in the neurodiversity and cognitive disability uh, space, you know, people come at problems differently. You know, we, we all approach how we read, how we take information in, how we look at software, how we construct things. All of those things are done differently, even between disabled people. So having all of that difference helps us to understand different solutions. It helps us to see how we might look at things differently. It helps us to look at new markets. It helps us to see how we could be operating differently. It helps us to get away from competition into collaboration. All of these things which are the way of the future. You know, so we actually want disabled people in our workforces because it's going to help us in so many ways. And we want to be using the difference and, and how that looks instead of expecting everyone to be the same. So we might not all use the same um, type of software. We might not all use the same work conditions. We might di work differently. Um, we've learned a lot in the pandemic about working from home, about what that does and how we work different hours, different structures, the different ways that that makes people more effective. You know, we need to be embracing this and thinking about how we can bring this into the modern workforce of the future so that we can grow diversity. And through that, we can actually have different decision making at the top of organisations and different ways of structuring and strategy and how organisations take themselves forward. And, in a, 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 you know, right now, as, as we're talking to each other, we've got the big climate change conversation going on. 
um, that the world is, is really tackling this very, very big problem. It's a really good time to recognise that we need as much difference of thought and difference of approach as we can possibly get. And we don't just need it in the workforce, we need it in leadership. We need all of those people to be approaching the, the way the world will look into the future. And we need it done differently. We need all of those different perspectives. We're not going to tackle these really big problems otherwise. We need all of that difference to help solve the big challenges. That's that's really true. And what about neurodiverse individuals? Have you what is your experience with them? And I like it when you talk when it comes to neurodiverse individuals, right? It's an invisible disability in the day. So many of them do conceal it. And how can they make a change within the organization? Well, something that I um I often talk to, I, you know, I do coaching, leadership coaching, and I often talk to the, the people I'm coaching about understanding how they work best. So, you know, that, that might be as simple as what time of day do you work better? Some of us are good in the morning, some of us in the evening. That's a very simple sort of way of looking at it. There's other ways of looking at it too. Are you the sort of person who's a big picture person or a detail person? Are you the kind of person who likes to talk about something or do you need to read the detail? Um, how do you take your information in? Understanding how we all work differently, how we process our information, how we create information and share it with other people gives us a really good idea of how to work more effectively. Rather than trying to all do it in the same way, and that can be really exhausting, you know, if we're pushing our brains into a way that isn't right for us, it's really tiring and we're not as effective. So understanding ourselves as disability leaders and understanding how we work best so that we can use that, so that we're not exhausting ourselves. You know, we're already tired enough. Disability is already a thing. So we need to just recognise that um, and own it, use it. Um, use it to come at a problem differently, to approach a problem differently. Use the way we think differently to um, ask the questions that nobody else might ask. Use it to think about a different structure. Why are we doing it this way when we could be doing it that way? We want all of that coming together. It is very challenging and very difficult, particularly for people who are concealing their disability at work. But I think you can still do that. I'm not suggesting people should take the risk. I mean, we don't want people losing their job. That's not the answer. What we want is people to be understanding themselves well enough so that they're able to use their disability as an asset. Use it to help them in their work. And through that, it may become less risky to be open about how they think and how they operate. That's it's an idea. No, that's, <laughs> it's an idea. This reminds me of one other person that I know who's a neurodiverse individual. And she uh, joined the company through an internship program. And she openly spoke about her disability. And they nurtured her, they supported her, they identified her skill set. She was from completely changed from one background to another. And now she's leading an initiative and she also won like won multiple awards for that initiative and trying to make a change for individuals similar to her. So I think that the nurturing, the support system is important, right? I think it is. I think it is. We're, we're, we are reaching a point now where a few of the really big business people like Richard Branson, for example, are starting to talk openly about their neurodiversity. Now, that's just one person, but we've got maybe, you know, half a dozen of these people that have come out recently, you know, Elon Musk talking about, about uh, you know, um, his autism. And I think these are the sorts of things that help us to recognise that people do succeed. Um, they do work differently and they do succeed. It doesn't make them um, brilliant human beings. But one of the things I appreciate particularly about Richard Branson's example, he's very open about the fact that he doesn't do um, the paperwork because it's not how his brain works. 
he's a big ideas person. He has ideas and he's a, he connects with people. He's really good at connecting with people. And so that's what he focuses on. And he gets other people to do the stuff that he's not so great at. And, and through that, he's, he's become a billionaire, you know, he's turned his, his career into a real success. So it's, it's knowing yourself well enough to know what you are excelling at and do that, you know, do that, focus on that stuff. The things you're not so great at, the things that take energy from you, put them to one side. We don't always have the choice, of course. We're not always in a position with enough power to be able to choose everything. But recognising and being able to talk openly about, you know, we don't have to say it's about a disability. We could be saying, look, uh, I'm more of a big picture person. I'm not so great at this detail. Who can we give the detail to on the team? Who's the, you know, there's always someone on a team who's great at detail and loves detail. Give it to them. I'll talk about the big picture, you know. And through that, the team is also working better as a team and using its different talents as a group. Instead, you know, we don't want a team to all be the same because, because that's not going to produce the outcomes. So we do want the different team members to celebrate the different talents, the different ways they approach things. Use your brain the best way your brain works. Yeah, that's actually really true. You know, uh, something that we also focus on hash is that not, you're not going to be able to do A to Z. There's a certain skill set, especially when it comes to neurodiverse individual, you have a certain skill set. Let them own that skill set. And generally, when you talk about a company, not everybody does everything, right? You no. use what you are capable of and excel in that. You don't have to work. I think many neurodiverse individuals worry about all the other things and that stops their potential, correct? Right? I think there's, um, there's something we need to acknowledge and that is that, um, you know, for those of us in the disability community, we spend a lot of time being just on the outside, just on the edges. And so it's, it's actually quite understandable that we will always be conscious. There's a certain amount of self-conscious of our position, you know, that we're not quite included. We're not quite part of the group. And that is a very difficult thing for us to be challenging from outside and I, I often question why it's up to us to be the ones changing the culture on the inside of the room when we're the ones outside of it. Really it's up to the people inside the room to be coming to us and asking what we need and asking what it should look like and all of us are going to want something different. You know, there's 1.3 disabled people on this planet. 1.3 billion disabled people on this planet. It's, you know, we're not all the same. So we actually need the people inside the room, mm -hmm. the people with the power, the people with the resources, to be coming to those of us on the outside, on the margins, on the fringes, rather than expecting us to change the system from outside. So it's, it, is a, it is about recognising people's power, recognising our own power as people in the room and changing the, what the room looks like. So, you know, I would strongly suggest that people should not feel responsible for making their disability okay. You don't have to be um, making people comfortable. You don't have to be hiding your disability so that it's less confronting for other people just be yourself because actually that's pretty good as it is and it's remarkably useful for for the work that you're doing um you're doing this work because it's it you're attracted to it it makes it makes your heart sing so you know be yourself that's actually really true you know uh, the difference starts within it's not outside like we're all different nobody's the same in the way and i think as you said, just be yourself and if everybody, just see them for the individual that they are. And it's also important, like how you said, I don't think from outside, it's also people with power, especially in leadership role, can make the change. And also the employees, the individuals, the teammates who are going to work with them, even they matter a lot. They do, they do. And I, we need to remember that there's a whole bunch of stuff in management speak. Um, you know, culture comes from the top. 
So you actually need the people at the very tops of organisations to be pushing this stuff. But we also need the people who are leading teams. They're critical. So team leaders need to be the ones, managers, supervisors, need to be the people who are really embracing all of the difference in their team. And of course, we hope that more and more disabled people are the team leaders. And through that, that the culture shifts and it moves up and it moves up and it moves up. That's something that we're also trying to do. You know, uh, within our neurodiverse communities, so there are many of them learn to coding. And now we're trying to create a support system among themselves. So where they become team leaders and support the younger, like the new generation that's coming in. And that's the beauty, right? Because they will understand the needs more than what we would do. And you're giving them the power to change now, making it more open, not just for individuals with disabilities, but for many different people. That's right. That's right. I was talking to a colleague in the diversity community this morning, um, uh, not a disabled person, and we, we, we both acknowledge that, you know, we're in diversity. We want, we want everyone to be diverse. Yeah, <laughs> it's, exactly. it's fantastic. <laughs> So recognising that we're all different, um, the challenge of that, it's so enriching. Um, it's so um, invigorating to work alongside people who think differently to you. And, uh, you know, the teams that I've run over the years, you know, where everybody is really different, they push you into doing things that you might not have thought of otherwise. Um, I am a big picture person, so when I've got someone on my team who's the detail person and they say, I need to understand what this is going to look like, and I find that, you know, my first, my first initial response is, oh, this is really annoying, but then I think, no, you're actually helping me to come to a better outcome. The team, you know, I've got a big idea, but you're going to help me make it into something that's actually going to work. I can't do that by myself. So we want teams to really be looking different. We want everybody to understand what diversity can bring to the table and, yeah, enjoy diversity. It's the best thing. It really is. What about your uh, leadership? Uh, you do a lot of leadership workshops, right? So what has been the outcome and is there any success stories that you would like to share with us if that is? <laughs> Oh, yes, I had a big success last week. Um, one of my, uh, we have a very big leadership program, goes for 12 months. Um, and one of our graduates, our, our alumni, um, has been appointed the chief technology officer at one of the major accounting firms um, last week. And uh, I'm so excited. <laughs> so, That's great. That's you, know, we, you know, we do see it making a difference. The, when... Um, when organisations support their staff, their disabled staff, to do leadership development, it seems to change a few things. It changes how the organisation looks at that person, but it also, and, and it sees suddenly that this person is, has leadership potential, but it also changes the way that person operates. They become more comfortable with themselves. They're not hiding their disability. They're actually starting to talk openly about their disability at work. And through that, they are being celebrated. You know, all these organisations actually want diversity. They just don't know what to do. They don't know how to get it. And so when somebody inside starts to be the person that is saying, yes, I'm disabled, but I'm also going to head for the leadership positions. I want to become a partner. I want to become an executive. Um, it's, it's changing the game. It's a very slow, very slow, very long haul. Um, but we're starting to see a few people who are graduating from our leadership programs starting to move they're being more recognised inside the organisations they work for. And because of that, we're starting to see a shift. It's really quite exciting. Um, so, I, you know, I, I just do a little happy dance inside every time I see somebody um, celebrated. We still have a lot of challenges. We still see a lot of people um, experiencing a lot of difficulty. It's very isolating if you're the only person the only disabled person in an entire um, branch or an entire 
division of an organisation, that can be really hard work and it's still the common experience, but gradually it's shifting. So we're starting to see members of the DLI um, start to pick each other out. And uh, they might not be open at work, but they'll all club together when they, uh, when they know who each other is. So they back each other, they support each other. So little things, just little things starting to shift ground. That's really nice to hear. And like you said, right, I think definitely at a bigger way to make this more inclusive for individuals with disability and even neurodiversity is that having someone in leadership role will definitely make it more acceptable towards company and it also creates a role model and that is very powerful right it's hugely important um you know we can we can think that role models are a bit old-fashioned um but actually they're critically important and when somebody is in a senior position and they're openly disabled all of those entry-level people all of those graduate students the the new graduate students can see where they can go. But they also can see that it's acceptable to be disabled. That's huge. That's a really big thing because only a decade ago, it wasn't acceptable. So yeah. it's, it's, it makes a very big difference. It's a very big difference. True. And it lets people be themselves. That is the most important thing. And when you're comfortable, your productivity also increases. You bet, you bet. That's it's actually the most important thing. Um, when when people are being themselves, they they work better. They work better. They're not being they're not being um, um, exhausted by pretending to be somebody else. Um, they're not they're not trying to do work that actually drains them of their energy. Um, they're able to do what makes them work well. They're able to be themselves. They work better with their colleagues. They're much happier and, and more interactive. They collaborate better. And collaboration is a really strong leadership skill. It's most important. So people who are able to collaborate, who are able to let go and share, are much more likely to be having very, very good outcomes for their business. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. And I hope uh, people in power who are hearing this create more opportunities for individuals with disability to come in leadership roles so the true change can happen. Is there anything that you'd like to add? Uh, I think you're right. You know, we want people who are in positions of power and authority. Look around you. Where are the disabled people? And if you can't see anyone, and I don't mean visible disability. If you don't know that there are disabled people there, mm -hmm. ask why not? Ask why not? And what are you doing about it? What are you doing to make it change? So true, so powerful. Thank you so much, Krishna, for joining us today. Thank you so much for listening to our Global Dialogue series on neurodiversity. Our next episode will be on 8 March with Lena, Senior UX Designer in BBC and the Neurodiversity Lead for the BBC CAPE Initiative. Lena talks about her inspiring journey, how she overcame her barriers and became a positive role model for many neurodiverse individuals like herself. Till then, take care and have a great week.